March 22nd, 2014. It was a lazy Saturday morning in the Steelhead Haven neighborhood. It's a development of about 40 homes along the North Fork of the Stillaguamish River in tiny Oso, Washington, population about 250. The Stilly, as the river is called by locals, is popular for summer rafting trips as it meanders its way along Highway 530 out of the northern Cascade Mountains and through the valley. Everyone expects a lot of rain in this pocket of the Northwest, but in 2014, it was a record-setting start to the year. The valley received double its average amount of rain, with about 15 inches in February and March alone. But on this Saturday, the clouds made way for blue sky, and generations of families were out enjoying the day. Spring was in the air. Then, at 10.37 a.m. There's like a mudslide and everything's gone. The houses are gone. What? Is there any injuries? Oh, there's a propane. There's a propane leak. You could. I mean, all I see is dirt now. We watched tons of the trees come falling. Okay, is there any? And it's no longer. 911, what is your emergency? There has been a huge landslide and it's pushed the house all the way across the road. In a matter of minutes, 911 dispatchers were flooded with calls coming in from across the valley. Oh, wow. Wow, it's really flooding back oh, it's because on, it's on the road itself. There's so many they people been, yelling for they, help. They've been dispatched, okay? What happened? Can you tell us what happened? It, it looks like we had a mudslide in the area, but we do have the fire department dispatched out there, okay? This is the story of the Oso landslide. It's the deadliest landslide in U.S. history. 43 people died when a hillside above Oso, Washington suddenly collapsed. The event forever changed the lives of so many, including families who lost loved ones, first responders, rescuers, even journalists that covered the traumatic events day after day, like myself and many of my colleagues. In this podcast series, you'll hear stories about what happened, why it happened, and how the tragedy reshaped this community forever. I'm Jake Wittenberg with King 5 News. This is Oso. Smells so good in here. <laughs> Fried onions and burger. I wish I was cooking for the for the volunteers, but we haven't had a call in two weeks. So. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Pretty. About four miles up the road to the west is what you might consider downtown Oso. For the most part, there's a general store, the Oso Community Chapel, and the fire station. That's where we found Chief Harper cooking at the station kitchen. He's still chief ten years later. We 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 try not to be here too much, but. Um, it definitely has its advantages being in a small community. On that Saturday morning, he was spending his weekend laying low, getting some work done around the house. So 10.45, the call came in for a roof in the middle of the road. Uh, kind of a strange call to get. We've had some, you know, some, some wind in the, in the past and a lot of rain, so we thought maybe a, a shed roof had blown into the highway or something. So, Chief Harper loaded up his station truck and headed east on Highway 530 toward the scene. Out in the of we'll be As I pulled over the hill and down into where the road was blocked, nothing really made sense. So there, there was a roof in the middle of the road. Uh, there was a PUD truck there and a few civilians. We were kind of standing around trying to figure out what was going on. And we're hearing um, cries from somewhere over there. Are you guys hearing them for your end? We're getting on the radio and asking questions and not, not really getting any information. This is a major slide here. I'm just letting you know that we're hearing uh, cries, possibly a child. At this first, side. crews didn't know which direction this came from. Chief Harper recognized that barn roof in the middle of Highway 530 from the south side of the road in an area known to be unstable. On rainy years, there have been a few mudslides on that slope that locals called Skagland Hill. But they soon discovered this slide was much bigger and came from an entirely different direction. Uh, this is a major uh, event here, and uh, we need additional resources. Washington State Trooper Rocky Oliphant was patrolling for speeders on I-5 and was the first law enforcement officer to arrive at the scene. Well, I was the only one headed out there, and so I came around a corner, uh, came to the bottom of the hill, and there, blocking the road, was just water, trees. There was an uh, entire house that was just sitting in the middle of State Route 530. A little more than you expected. Much more than I expected, yes. Uh, we didn't know how big the slide was at that point either. We, I knew it, uh, what I could see, but you couldn't see the entire slide from our vantage point. 
The Oso landslide came from a half a mile north, not south. The slide was so massive, it tore through the valley, taking the Stillaguamish River with it, following the floodplain, and eventually over Highway 530. When it reached Skaglin Hill a half a mile away, the mud and debris avalanche swirled back onto itself like an eddy in a river. Rescue crews were only seeing a tiny portion of the immense devastation. For a moment, the valley was a lake, and it was growing by the minute. I had two individuals that started walking out into the slide, and I yelled out to them like, hey guys, let's not go in there just because of all the, the unknowns of, you know, we have these logs floating on the water. We don't know how deep the water is. Um, there's propane smells, there's power lines in the road. I don't know what potential risks there are for those two people going out. They, they looked back to me and told me they were not going to obey uh, what I was asking them to do. I was asking them not to go further in. They went anyways. They got halfway out into there and they heard a baby crying. And at that point, they yelled back at me and told me that. And that was when it's like, OK, we need, to, we need to do what we can to try to save wherever this baby is and get him back to safety. One of my buddies that was there, a civilian, he said, well, I'm, I'm going in to help. And I looked at one of the other firefighters and said, well, if he's going in, we're going in. And so we started into the mud. Mud is a term that may give the wrong impression. First responders described it as a kind of witch's brew of river water, mud, propane, sewage, giant cedar trees, and other debris. Everything that might be found in a neighborhood was now stirred together in a kind of toxic sludge. It was up to our necks and you couldn't, so you couldn't walk in it. As soon as it got to your waist, you were just kind of sloshing around and there was debris below the mud, so you couldn't really just walk through it like through water. And we're gonna try to walk in and locate, uh, we've got a possible victim out in the slide. We're hearing uh, cries, possibly a child from this side. Those cries were coming from five-month-old Duke Siddharth and his mom Amanda. Protected in his mother's arms, baby Duke was alive, but in grave condition when Chief Harper and others sliced through the wreckage of the family home with a chainsaw and found the pair trapped and nearly unconscious. She was basically under a couch in a tree and the tree was in like 10 to 12 feet of mud. One of the guys reached in and grabbed her baby from her and he was, he was turning blue. <clears throat> uh, I remember turning around and handing him to Steve and just saying, do what you can for this guy, we'll focus on her. I'm sending out one victim, appears to be about a six month old baby, uh, Red. One of the guys that was there with me was uh, a logger buddy of mine from Darrington. He literally crawled inside this cave and cut the tree away from her and we slid her out. She's currently trapped and we're trying to extricate. She has a possible broken leg and a laceration to her head. <sighs> Sorry, I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> Uh, I remember every single detail of it, I, like it was yesterday. We, him and I were sitting there watching YouTube. I heard a rumble. I was like, oh, an earthquake. Looked out our window, and I didn't see anything. So then I looked out our front door, and our neighbor's chimney was coming straight at us, and all I could do was turn. I just yelled out, oh, God, no, and then it went black. That's Amanda today. Ten years later, she says there are daily reminders. Amanda and her husband, Ty, have since moved to another area of Snohomish County. Ty had just left the family home to run errands 15 minutes before the landslide hit. I mean, still to this day, it kind of feels like, what the heck happened? It was a wave. It literally pushed us. And then as soon as it slowed down, we like went backwards a little bit. And then we're just still. And all I could hear were the birds. And I was like, do they understand what just happened? <laughs> Like, am I in the twilight zone here? I don't know. It was really scary, and I think that's... I think that's probably the loneliest I've ever felt. I kept yelling, please help me, I have a baby. Please help me, I have a baby. And I would hear siren after siren, and then I started to hear yelling. Finally, somebody came up, and I didn't even see his face. I just saw a lot of hair. A logger by the name of Quinn Nations. I owe him a lot. He is the only person that really kept me sane that day, or like tried to calm and comfort me. Um, they had to resuscitate Duke at the scene. So if they really would have waited a little longer, he'd be, 
he wouldn't be here. Amanda has mm -hmm. lifelong injuries from that day. So I have titanium mesh in my left eye socket. I have three plates in my left arm, a rod down my right leg, and then two plates in my left ankle. And now I get to wear a brace every day. <laughs> As for Duke, Come here, Duke, who's now 10 years old. Have a seat, my friend. Life has been perhaps more difficult. Hi, buddy. Hey. Okay, so make sure you look so. not, not towards the sun, but you have to listen to direction, okay? <laughs> How are you? Good. Duke is the sweetest kid. Today, he's wearing his favorite cowboy boots and sweater to dress up for the interview. A scar is visible on both sides of his head. Zigzags across my head yep, because... Yeah, across, huh? Yes, stitches. All I can recall is the name of the slide also. It's been hard. It's been really hard. Um, between his surgeries and his TBI and his almost daily seizures, it's a lot. I'm thankful and grateful that we're here. It's just been a lot. Is life hard, buddy? Is it hard to have all that? Yeah. I, I try inside my head. It's like I try and run away from it. It's been like that for years in my head. It's been like, how am I going to get this away from me? How am I going to get rid of it? Her neighbors along Steelhead Drive were not so lucky. They were home at the time of the slide, too. I think, why every day? I think, why am I here every day? Um, I have a lot, a lot of survivor's guilt. Since the slide, Amanda and her husband, Ty, have had another child. The boy, now seven years old, is named Quinn after the logger who rescued his mom and brother. We have met with him a couple times. I can't imagine him with a different name. And I, I mean, that was the least I could do to, to thank somebody for what they did for me and for Duke. I owe him I owe him a lot. Tell that to all units, command units, on 530. We need units to coordinate with the helicopters. Two helicopters, one working, another inbound. Within 30 minutes of that rescue of Amanda and baby Duke, a Snohomish County helicopter crew was already inbound. They would provide the first view of the enormous disaster that was just now coming into focus. Still to come, the unprecedented response. Uh, I think we're looking at a catastrophic event. Helicopter crews get their first aerial view of the incredible disaster. We made one pass downstream over the pile and we didn't see anybody. And that's when we spotted the two ladies on the rooftop. The water was still coming in. The mud was still coming in. My house had been destroyed. And even career trained emergency managers find their breaking point. I asked uh, God for help because I said I'm in trouble. I'm Jake Wittenberg. We'll see you tomorrow in episode two of Oso Life after America's deadliest landslide.